Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'm happy to be here and have this opportunity to, to speak with you, to give you this message that I believe the Lord has given to me. Um, and I'm kind of excited to share with you, so I, if you don't mind, I'd like to just jump in. Turn with me to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, and I know most of us are very familiar with this. We're going to start in verse 9. We're going to read the third angel's message. Revelation 14, verse 9. Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. And I want to focus on verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now some verses say endurance of the saints. So there's going to be this group of people at the end who have the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Those two things are going to be blended, and there's something about those two things that enables them to endure through the end. So our goal today is to look at this patience of the saints and try to figure out what exactly this is and what it means for you and me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I just pray, Lord, that your spirit will move among us, that your angels will be present to press the truth into our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive the truth that you have for us today. And Lord, if there's something that I have prepared that is not according to your will, I pray that you would not let me speak it. And if there's anything else that you want to add to what I've prepared, please impress me. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to start with going to something that Ellen White said in Review and Herald, April 1, 1890. And I, I probably should have gone through the effort to make a PowerPoint because I'm gonna be quoting a lot of Ellen White and I hope that's okay. She says, several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. She goes on to say, this message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for humanity. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This message that God commanded to be given to the world, it is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in large measure. Now I could stop right here. I think that's, that's a wonderful sermon in and of itself in one paragraph. But I want to build a case from Scripture with the support of Ellen White. And then we're going to make this thing practical. Okay, that's the plan. Now I want you to put your thinking caps on because it's, I'm going to go a little deep into it. But I want you guys to have a firm foundation for this. So when the application comes, you can accept it. Is that okay? 
So the third angel's message is justification by faith. What does that mean for us? Let's start by looking at Abraham's faith. After all, he is the father of the faithful, isn't he? Turn with me to Genesis 15. Genesis chapter 15. And we're going to be starting in verse 1. <clears throat> Genesis 15, verse 1. And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, to be born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, talking about Eliezer. Abraham's like, well, is Eliezer going to be my heir? And God's like, no, no. But the one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then God brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and count the stars, if you're able to number them. And God said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So how was Abraham justified? How was he made righteous? By simply believing what God said. Now, I want to look more closely at what God said to him. What specifically did Abraham believe? And I think we can see from the text that Abraham believed three things about God. Number one, he believed what God said about himself. Remember, the first thing God said to him, he says, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. So Abraham believed what God said about himself. Number two, Abraham believed what God said about him. What did God say about Abraham? He says, you are a father of many nations, right? Many peoples, many descendants, as many as the stars. And number three, Abraham believed that God would do what he said he would. And because Abraham believed these three things about God, God considered him righteous. Now this is very important, and we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna come back to this, so remember this. Now I think it's important to say here that when God made this promise to Abraham, was there any outward evidence whatsoever that it would happen? Nope. And I would say there was evidence to the contrary. Abraham was an elderly man, and he had no kids. In other words, if Abraham had outward evidence to believe that what God said would be true, faith would not be required. Right? What is faith? What is the definition of faith? We have a clear definition in Hebrews 11, verse 1. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right? And just a few verses later, in verse 6 in chapter 11 of Hebrews, it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is absolutely necessary in God's eyes. And this is precisely why God gave this promise without any evidence to support its fulfillment. Amen. Because as soon as we get evidence, faith ceases to exist. Amen. Right? Ellen White says this about faith in Christian experience and teachings, page 126. She says, here is faith, naked faith to believe that we receive the blessing even before we realize it. When the promised blessing is realized and enjoyed, faith is swallowed up. Faith is essential in God's eyes. And faith does not require evidence. Abraham had this faith, he had this naked faith he believed God's promise completely and exclusively because God is the one who gave it. 
He had no reason to believe it otherwise. So, Abraham believes this with all his heart. He believes God is saying, telling the truth, but there is a problem. There's a long wait. And because of this long wait, Abraham's faith begins to falter, right? He, uh, he and Sarah are getting older every day. They're running out of time to have kids, and they haven't heard from God in, in a long time. And maybe God forgot about his promise. Maybe they did something wrong. And so they start to panic. And we all know what they did, right? He and Sarah decide that God needed a little help with his promise. And so in their impatience, they decide to have a son through Hagar, Sarah's slave. This was a huge mistake. And it led to a lot of pain and heartache. But for us looking back, we can learn a lot from this. So let's go to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. And we're going to be starting at verse 21. Here Paul begins talking about the spiritual application of Abraham's situation with Sarah and Hagar. Let's start at verse, uh, let's read verse 21 to 23. It says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman or a slave, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman or slave was born according to what? The flesh. And he of the free woman through what? The promise. You know, Paul talks a lot about the flesh and the spirit. What does he mean by the flesh? In, in some instances, flesh can just simply refer to, you know, our, our physical bodies, right? But when he's comparing and contrasting flesh versus spirit, or in this case, flesh versus promise, we can consider flesh to mean our own thoughts and effort apart from Christ. Do you think that's a fair definition? So in other words, what Paul is saying here is that Isaac was born because of a promise that God made, while Ishmael was born because of Abraham's own willpower and effort apart from God. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Let's keep, let's keep going. Read verses uh, 24 to 26. Which things are symbolic? For these are two covenants. What's a covenant? It, it, it's like an agreement with God, right? These represent two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai. What happened at Mount Sinai? The law was given, right? The Ten Commandments. One from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage or slavery, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above, the, have the new Jerusalem, is free, which is the mother of us all. So what's Paul saying? Paul is saying that Sarah and Hagar represent two different covenants or agreements. Sarah represents the covenant of faith in the promises of God that leads to what? Freedom, right? And Hagar represents the covenant of trying and effort apart from God, right? That leads to what? Bondage. Slavery. So we have the old covenant, which is slavery, versus the new covenant, which is freedom. Now listen to what Ellen White says in Eternity Past, page 260. She says, The terms of the old covenant were obey and live. Okay? But also, cursed be that he that conformeth not all of the words of this law to do them. 
That's uh, Deuteronomy 27, 26. Then she goes on to say, but if the Abrahamic covenant contained the promise of redemption, why was another covenant formed at Sinai? In their bondage, the people had to a great extent lost the knowledge of the principles of the Abrahamic covenant. So in other words, the Sinai covenant was given to, because the people's minds were so warped after 430 years of slavery that they had no capacity to understand the principles of God's original covenant with Abraham. Does that make sense? So God essentially had to spell it out for them. She continues, the people did not realize the sinfulness of their own hearts and that without Christ, it was impossible for them to keep God's law. Feeling able to establish their own righteousness, they declared, all that the Lord hath said we will do and be obedient. Then they readily entered into covenant with God. So the Israelites essentially said, this is simple. God even wrote it out, a, a nice convenient list for us. We got this. And what happened within mere days of getting that covenant? While God's glory was still on top of the Mount Sinai, what was Israelites doing? They were worshiping the calf. This was literally days after they said, we will obey. So then they came to their senses and they said, God, please forgive us. We will obey. Then what would happen? They would fall. They would sin again, right? And then they would repent and say, oh Lord, we're so sorry. Then what would happen? They'd sin again. The whole history of the Israelites was that vicious cycle, sin, repent, sin, repent. I'm sorry, please forgive us, but we'll do better. They were living under the old covenant. They were trying to keep the law through the flesh by their own effort, which is an impossibility. And so they became slaves to sin because they had no power in and of themselves to overcome it. Is this making sense? Are you tracking with me? Now, it's going to start coming a little closer to home. Let's go to Romans. Romans 7. Romans chapter 7. We're going to start at verse 14. And while you're turning there, let, let me ask you uh, this question. What is a slave? You can answer. It's not a trick question. Slave is someone who is someone else's property, right? But also, a slave is forced to do things that they do not want to do, right? All right. With this definition in mind... Let's read uh, Romans 7, verses 14. Now, there's a big debate on this, on this chapter. Is Paul describing a genuine Christian experience, or is he describing slavery to sin? Let's read, see if we can find out. Uh, verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. That's our first clue. For what I do not understand, for I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin who dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, 
Who will deliver me from this body of death? How many of you can relate to this? You don't have to raise your hands. But I know I do. I can relate. You know what you're doing is wrong. You've been convicted of it many times, but you can't stop. You have zero self-control. So you do this thing and you feel awful. You feel so terrible. You feel like you're, you're, the, you're the worst. And so you repent. You promise, Lord, I'm going to stop this. This is it. I am done with this. But then you do it again. Then you feel terrible again. And so you repent again and ask for forgiveness. And you may stop doing it for a while, but at some point you sin again. And the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. This can be the most frustrating and discouraging thing. But I would read Romans 7, and I would be like, well, I, evidently this is the Christian life. I guess this is just my cross to bear. I guess I'll just do my best and, and ask for forgiveness every time I mess up. And praise God, he does, forgiveness to, he does forgive us, doesn't he? Amen. But is this as good as it gets? Is this the Christian life? In Ministry of Healing, page 175, she talks about this experience. Feeling the terrible power of temptation, the drawing of desire that leads to indulgence, many a man cries in despair, I cannot resist evil. Tell him he can, that he must resist. He must have been overcome, or he may have been overcome time and time again, but it need not be always thus. He is weak in moral power, controlled by the habits of a life of sin. His promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. Have you ever tried to make a rope made of sand? How'd that work out? The knowledge of his broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens his confidence in his own sincerity and causes him to feel that God cannot accept him or work with his efforts. Is that your experience today? Are you tired of going through this cycle, sin, repent, sin, repent, and a complete life of defeat? Do you question your own sincerity? Do you wonder if you even want deliverance? So, going back to Romans, with this definition of slave in mind, what do you think? Is Paul describing a genuine Christian experience, or is he describing slavery to sin? You don't have to answer out loud if you're not sure. But I would like to submit that he's describing slavery to sin. A slave is compelled to do what? The things he does not want to do. Isn't that exactly what Paul's describing? Also, if you look at verse 24, what does Paul beg for? Look at, let's look back. Verse 24, what is he begging for? Deliverance. Now, why would God deliver us from a genuine Christian experience? I think E.J. Wagner had it right. Listen to what he says in his book, Christ and His Righteousness, page 87. He says, What this bondage and captivity are has already been shown. It is the bondage of sin, the slavery of being compelled to sin, even against the will. By the power of inherited and acquired evil propensities and habits, does Christ deliver from a true Christian experience? No, indeed. Then the bondage of sin of which the epistle the, of the apostle complains in the seventh of Romans is not the experience of a child of God, but of the servant of sin. It is to deliver men from this captivity that Christ came. Praise God. Not to deliver us during this life from warfare and struggles, but from defeat. To enable us to be strong in the Lord in the power of his might, so that we could give thanks unto the Father 
And then he quotes scripture. He says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us to the kingdom of his dear son, through whose blood we have redemption. I think it's clear that Romans 7 is not describing a genuine Christian experience, but a slave of sin. Now, if that is your experience today, do not lose heart. There is hope. Okay? Trust me. But what he is describing in Romans 7 is someone who has agreed to the terms of the old covenant. And what are the terms? Remember? Obey and live. Doesn't say anything about Christ, does it? But they're obeying in the flesh through their own strength and effort apart from God. They're striving for righteousness by their own effort. They're doing the best they can. They're sincere, but their life is filled with failure and defeat. What about you? Is your life characterized by failure and defeat? Does it seem like the harder you try, the harder you fall? Are you a slave to sin? Do you find yourself completely incapable of resisting temptation? There's good news. The law that you're trying to keep on your own, God has already promised to write it in your heart, right? Jeremiah 31, 33, he says, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And you may say, yes, I've heard that verse all my life, but I don't really understand what it means. How does that happen? What is that even, what's that talking about? And that's what I'm going to try to figure out today with you. So instead of keeping the letter of the law through our own effort, Old Covenant, God has promised to make that law a part of who you are. This is the New Covenant. Remember what we talked about when we were talking about Abraham. What things, what did he believe about God? Remember the three things? Number one, he believed that what God said about himself, right? Number two, he believed what God said about him. And number three, he believed that God would do what he said he would do. Now, if we want to be justified or made righteous, it would make sense to me that our main objective would be to have the same faith Abraham had, right? So, we need to find out what God says about himself we need to find out what he says about us, and we need to find out what he said he's gonna do, right? Doesn't that make sense? And then it's our job to believe those things. So, what does God say about himself? He's the creator, right? Genesis tells us that. He's merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty? Exodus 34. His work is perfect. All his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright. That's Deuteronomy 32. What is impossible with men is possible with God. That's what he says about himself, Luke 18. He never lies. Titus 1-2 tells us that. God is love. 1 John 4-8 tells us that. And for all the promises of God in Christ are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. 2 Corinthians tells us that. Do you believe that? Do you believe those things about God? I just picked a few, but there's many more. Do you believe that God is who he says he is? Now here's where the rub comes. What does God say about us? Let's look at some things. Therefore, and I want you to notice the verbs that are used, okay? Pay attention to the words. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The next one, that, that, that's Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5. The next one, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1. You have been crucified with Christ. It is, or yeah, I said, sorry, Paul is saying, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ, what? Lives. Not will live at some point once we're good enough. He lives in us. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Escalations 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that anyone may boast. Ephesians 2. We were buried, therefore, with him in baptism, into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's Romans 6, 4. <clears throat> so you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 11. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and carried you into the kingdom of the son of his love. Colossians 1.13. God says some crazy things about us. Do you believe these things? Do you believe what God says about you? Listen to me. If you are in Christ, everything I just said is true about you. Now, do you believe it? Do you believe that you are a new creation? Do you believe that you are no longer under condemnation? Do you believe that Christ lives in you? Do you believe that you're walking in newness of life? Do you believe that you are dead to sin and alive in Christ? Amen. I can hear someone saying, yeah, I, I can see that the Bible does say those things, but it's, it's not really for me. It doesn't really apply to my situation, what I'm going through. Yes, it does. Amen. Or you might say, I know what the Bible says, I just don't feel it. Or, I don't see it happening in my life. All I see in my life is defeat, discouragement, hopelessness, and my own broken promises to God. Let me ask you this. Did Abraham have evidence in his life that suggested that what God said about him was true? He had zero evidence. If he had evidence, then he wouldn't have faith. But Abraham, he, everything in Abraham's life was screaming that what God said is not true about him. But he believed God anyway. He had no clue how it would happen. He had no clue when it would happen. But he knew that it would because God cannot lie. I said this earlier, but I'll say it again. Ellen White says, here is faith. Naked faith. To believe that receive the promised blessing even before we realize it. Now let me pause for a moment and say something. And I want to be clear just in case some of you may be hearing what I'm not saying. True faith 
does not lead to a violation of God's law. True faith always leads to obedience. Always. Actually, Wagoner says, we should not say faith leads to obedience, but that faith itself obeys. Faith is what writes God's law in our hearts through Christ. Wagoner on Romans, page 112, he says, by Christ's obedience, we are made righteous. This is because his life is now given to us and he lives in us. The obedience of Christ which saves us in, is his present obedience in us. And the obedience is to the law. Now, on the other side, on the other side of the coin, let me also say that I'm not preaching instant gratification, instant, <laughs> instant sanctification. Sanctification is a work of a lifetime. Do you believe that? And as long as Satan reigns, we will have self to subdue. We will still have this flesh, our weak flesh, to contend with, right? But what I'm saying is that if we are in Christ, he has delivered us from the slavery of sin. This is this idea of having to do the thing that we hate, which is sin, right? We no longer are forced to sin. So, what is our conclusion? Since all power is available to us, do you believe that in faith? All of the power of heaven is available to us through faith in Christ. And even Christ himself is living in our hearts by faith. There is no longer room for us to get upset at God for requiring the impossible. Does that make sense? Was it possible for Peter to walk on water? But through faith, he did. We have that same power available to us. Desire of Ages, page 668. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was a heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds to conformity to his will that when obeying him, we will be but carrying out our own impulses. This is the law in our hearts. It's who we are, right? God, when we're just obeying him and carrying out our own impulses, we're just naturally doing the law of God, right? What's the condition upon receiving this? It is our consent. We can only consent to let Christ do the work in our hearts. She goes on to say, as Christ lived the law in humanity, so we may do if we will take hold of the strong for strength. That sounds scary though, doesn't it? But it's not about trying. And I know that sounds like heresy. But if you're hearing what I'm saying, it's about letting Christ so, be so connected with you that his obedience flows out of our hearts organically, right? So let me ask you, are you struggling with sin in your life? Are you stuck in this cycle of sin, repent, sin, Repent. Are you struggling with unforgiveness today? You know you shouldn't be holding on to this thing, but you just can't let it go. Are you struggling with lust today? You've tried and tried and tried and tried to overcome it. You have no power to resist. But I'm here to tell you that in Christ, you are dead to sin. Now, do you believe it? That is what makes it a reality. Our belief. In Christ, you are forgiven if you believe it. You are cleansed 
if you believe it? Are you dealing with anxiety and depression? All the power in heaven is yours. You have overcome the darkness in Christ. And it's true if you believe it. You are a new creation in Christ. Old things are gone and all things are new. Listen to what Ellen White says, a call to stand apart, page 30. She says, you are a sinner. You cannot atone for your past sins. You cannot change your heart and make yourself holy. But, but God promises to do all of this for you through Christ. You believe that promise, you confess your sin and give yourself to God, and you will to serve him. And just as surely as you do this, God will fulfill his word to you. If you believe the promise, believe that you are forgiven and cleansed, God supplies the fact. Praise God for that. You are made whole, just as Christ gave the paralytic power to walk when the man believed that he was healed. It is so if you believe it. This is still her talking. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole, but say, I believe it, it is so, not because I feel it, but because God has promised. Amen. This is naked faith. Why does she call it naked? When you're naked, what's the, I know when I'm naked, I feel vulnerable, right? <laughs> it's this believing God when you have, when all your senses are telling you, this, this is not good. This is irresponsible to, to believe this right now because there's nothing that says this will happen. That is naked faith. And when you read when Jesus healed people, notice what he says so often when he heals them. Luke 17, verse 19, he says, your faith has made you well. Luke 18, 42, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Matthew 9, 29, then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be done to you. Luke 7:50. Then he said to the woman, "Your faith has saved you. Go in peace." Mark 10:52. Then Jesus said to him, "Go your way. Your faith has made you well." Matthew 9:22. Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well. This is what Jesus is saying to you today. Be of good cheer. You can rest. It's okay, you can rest in Jesus. He wants you to rest. You were never meant to carry that burden that you're carrying right now. Amen. Be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Do you believe you're well? You are no longer a slave to sin. You no longer have to live in darkness. You are not who the enemy says you are. You are who God says you are. You are a son of the king. You're a daughter of the king. You have the righteousness of Christ. Jesus is living in your heart through faith. You no longer have to live this life of defeat. You have victory. All these things are true if you believe they're true because God has promised them to be true. And right now, some of you may crying out to the Lord saying, Lord, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. You can't seem to bring yourself to believe it. It, it, it sounds weird and it just seems like it's not true in my life right now. How can I believe? Don't let that keep you from coming to Christ. He says, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Come to him, 
Even if you don't believe yet, he won't cast you out. You know, I'm convinced that this message is the third angel's message. This is the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And I believe that this message will soon swell to a loud cry and then we're going home. I can't wait for that. Lord, we want to go home. We want to see your face. This world has nothing for us. And we want to have the patience of the saints. This faith that will get us through the time of trouble. The faith that will endure. We want a faith that will lead us to you to your promises, because you have promised to give us everything we need. It's ours to grasp through faith. Lord, we believe what you say about us, and we we rejoice in the freedom that you give. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.